Um, I'm going to start because it's 11 and I don't want to make everything else run late. So I will start right now. I hope, I mean, I can give you the slides after if you didn't see or I can just explain them really well. <laughs> Uh, thank you all for coming. I've literally never been this popular in my life, so this is a little bit mind-blowing. Um, so I'm assuming you're all here to see character design, creating with care, which is my talk today. A little bit of an introduction to me. That's me. This is me. Um, I am the founder and director of Weirdron Games, which is a little narrative studio. Um, we're three years old, released our first game last year, working on our second one now. I also lecture at the University of West London. I do a lot of visual design stuff, concept artsy stuff with them. And I also have a load of nonprofit organizations that I'm associated with that are just trying to make the games industry a better place. And I also do a lot of outsourcing work with other indie studios. So what's this talk gonna cover? Well, it's going to cover the inclusive design and its benefits. Um, Inclusive design has benefits not just to your character work, also to your game and also to your business overall. So I think it's quite important. We're going to cover player representation and the stats, which is the boring bit, but it means a lot and we have to look at it. Then we'll go into looking at studio representation and how important it is to have a diverse studio and have lots of voices in the room. And then what I'd love for you to be able to walk away from this talk today with is practical real applicable tips that you can put on your portfolio or take back to your respective studios and talk with your studio about. So I'm hoping that this is gonna spread the word. And overall, I just want you to make better designs. So I'm assuming everybody understands the importance of character design, but just in case we will go over it. Character design, pretty important when we have a game with characters in it. It enhances the overall experience for your player. It's the conduit by which your player navigates your world space or it interacts with NPCs. So it's basically the introduction to your world, right? It influences the player into making a connection with that world because you're signposting hints about what you want that player to experience. Through every visual choice you make, you're showing your player how you want them to interact with the world. And the characters that inhabit your world will shape the way the player feels about that world. So it's quite a nice little way to get your player to very quickly understand how your game is gonna be played and what you want them to feel. So I'd like to introduce you to the concept of inclusive design. If you already know what inclusive design is, yay, well done. We're gonna go over it now though. So this is the intentional and purposeful creation of characters that are representative of a diverse group of identities. And the reason I want to talk about this, as I said, is because it has a multitude of benefits, not just to your independent work, but to your studio overall. And frankly, we have the stats that it makes games better. So, yeah, make better games. The first thing we can do is representation. So by including diverse identities and underrepresented groups, we allow them to feel seen and validated. This creates a bigger community, it fosters a sense of belonging and inclusion, and it also helps to break stereotypes and challenge biases, promoting empathy among your players. So overall, you just have a better community. It also expands your player base. So by making video game characters relatable and appealing to a diverse group of players, your video game will attract a bigger audience. And what does a bigger audience get you? More sales. And what do we love? More sales. Um, Enhanced player engagement, inclusive character design encourages players from different backgrounds to connect with the game on a deeper level. And this um, is, ugh, sorry. <laughs> this leads to increased interest, immersion and enjoyment and players feel included. And as I said, you get a stronger community. So when players from diverse backgrounds feel welcomed and acknowledged through inclusive character design, there's a stronger community. Like how many of us have played a game and then found somebody else who also likes that game and also likes that character and you're instantly like best friends. Stronger community, more game hype, increased sales. Authentic storytelling. So by including a wide variety of characters in your video game, you enhance the storytelling by presenting a broader range of narratives. This allows us as game developers to explore more diverse cultural, social, and personal experiences, resulting in more captivating stories. 
Through inclusion of diverse characters, video games can tackle complex themes and address real world issues with depth, subtlety, and consideration. Better stories, better engagement, bigger sales. Basically what I'm trying to hint at is when you make better games, you sell more games. Good games are good sales. This is one of my favorites, creative opportunities. So by encouraging creativity and innovation in character development, video games can benefit from breaking away from traditional archetypes and stereotypes. And we have the opportunity to explore fresh and unique character concepts pushing the boundaries of conventional character design, and this contributes to the overall growth and evolution of the games industry. Now, maybe this is the games lecturer in me trying to get out, but whenever I look at designs, I'm like, iterate, iterate, iterate. Try weird stuff. Have fun when you're drawing. Make something weird, throw it away, bring it back, squish it with other things, like just keep iterating on your design. I try always to not be too precious with my first design, and they throw it away and I do something better. I, I say this to my students all the time, you should be completely redoing every design over and over and over, and you'll find all the best bits of every design and bring them together. Social impact. So video games wield a considerable influence on public, popular culture, and it's capable of shaping social attitudes. We've seen this in lots of the movements in recent years. We've seen games that have really broken stereotypes and have massive fan bases rally around them for social change. So I feel we have a responsibility as designers and developers to foster a more inclusive and equitable gaming community by extension that will then empower communities outside of the games industry and promote social change. So no pressure. I really want you to be able to walk away from this and think, yes, I can add more diversity and more inclusion to my designs, but I just want to point out what can happen when we do this carelessly, hence the name of the talk. So how many people have played Cyberpunk? Yeah, cool, cool. Um, this is a Timoko, so it's um, very important to the Maori of Aotearoa, New Zealand, which is where I grew up, if you didn't know. Um, and it's a, it's a symbol of achievement and status, and you earn your Timoko. So you can't just get it, you have to earn it, and it's a symbol of achievements in your life. By placing it in a game with no cultural context and not allowing our player to understand the meaning of that, it's sort of cultural dress up, and we're losing all of the nuance. So we have to be very careful when we are applying, like I want you to go out and make diverse characters, but just be very careful when you're applying things as sort of a sticker or an aesthetic because it's cool. We still need to understand and we need to offer our player understanding as well. And also interchangeable cultures are not great. So um, who's played Overwatch? Yep. Farah, canonically Egyptian, and it was only after controversy that they decided to loop in some law that there was maybe some Native American heritage but also that was off of the game in its own law on its own website where, you know, your average player potentially isn't going to go look for it. And it sort of felt like an afterthought and an apology to clean up an initial mess. So just also be careful when you are designing things that if you do take a wrong step, we can correct it. We don't have to say, oh, no, no, it was supposed to be like that from the start. We can just own up to our mistakes and, you know, nobody's perfect. We're always learning. This is a good thing. So things to consider when you start your character design. Things we need to think about is who is this character? What is their motivation, their background, the cultural context in which they're going to exist or have existed, and the narrative of your story. So it's essential to approach character creation with sensitivity to avoid the perpetuation of stereotypes and harmful narratives. And without that careful planning, characters lack depth and consistency in unique traits. So to ensure the development of believable and relatable characters, planning and research are essential. And that's not just because I'm a teacher. Diversity comes in many forms. We shouldn't just have that one token character that has one token trait that's different in a sea of very similar faces. There are many ways we can diversify our designs, to name a few, but there are many more. I actually really love when a game flips the script on a character. So are you taking the ring to Mordor? Are you fighting a dystopian, you know, corrupt government? Make it a granny. 
that's way cooler and way more exciting to me. And all of the different possibilities that come into my head for that character design are instantly way more fun. I start to think about special abilities. I start to think about who this character is. Why are they adventuring at such a late age? What is their backstory? It's just so much more exciting. So when you are starting to think about your character, try and think about stepping away from that first reaction of who that character might be. Just apply one of these and be like, what could they have that makes them different? And what is the motivation for that? Again, um, I've just included a little slide there. If you haven't played Doris and the Dragon, it is about a grandma that basically takes down the underworld and it is amazing. There is enough tea for everyone. This is a very British thing. We worry about our tea. Not every game is made for you. Not every game is your cup of tea. There is enough tea. I have seen this stat that there are 34 games released every day on Steam alone to scare junior designers to have them know how much competition is out there and that their game has to stack up against 34 other games released in a day. But I actually think this is a really positive thing. 34 games are released a day. That is more games for me to play. That is more games for me to find and me to love. Awesome. As a gamer, there is literally nothing better than more games. The problem is, is we have to stand out amongst those games. So if those games have the same protagonist, the same hero's journey, the same villain, the same everything, that's super boring. I want badass granny. I don't want the same protagonist every time in every 34 game a day. So instead of worrying about oversaturation of the market, we need to think about how we stand out, how our characters live and breathe in our games and how they are different. The stats bit, yay. 80% of all main characters are men, 55% of that 80 are white. That doesn't make sense because 50% of gamers in the UK identify as female. So surely supply and demand, it would be an even split, but it's not. So my thinking behind this and lots of much cleverer people's thinking behind this is that it must have to do with who's in the workforce. So only 30% of game workers identify as female and only 11% are from ethnically diverse backgrounds. And I think that bleeds into the games that we're making. So if we don't have a diverse team, we don't end up with diverse games, we end up with the same games, we end up with the same 34 a day. See where it's going? So what happens when we do have a diverse team? Well, first of all, our profits go up and our decision-making gets better. The stats to prove it. Broadened perspectives. So diverse perspectives enrich the creative process. I adore being challenged in the creative room. I will always push to have a better design, not only for me, not only for the kudos that come with a better design, but also for my players and giving them a better experience. You also end up with authentic representation because the people in your room are the people who can comment on your designs. And sometimes I look at games and I think, man, if there had been a woman in that room, that character would not look like that. So it's just about having those people in the room to say, that is a dumb idea, stop, before everybody says that is a dumb idea, stop. Cultural competence. So one of the cool things about games is that they're global. One of the cool things about having lots of different cultures around the world is that we have different things we love, different things we hate, different things that are taboo. So having cultural competency and knowing what's going to work in each market is awesome because then you can release good things into good markets and not offend anybody, which is a positive. So having that competence and that understanding in your studio, such a benefit. And also innovation and market potential. It means you can move globally around the world, you can make better designs, you've got people in the room who are gonna challenge you, push you, innovate. This is the practical bit, what do we get to do? So we know that inclusive designers, we know the benefits it can bring, so now how do we ourselves do the work? I know I'm a lecturer, so I'm gonna say research and education, but it is so important to educate yourself especially if you are working on a character who is not like you. And I mean that in like any way, if it's a different age, different everything, you should be doing your research. And I always advocate for free resources. So I love a local library. A Google search is not good enough here. You need to find reliable and reputable sources. So not just Googling using actually scholarly research, using um, PhD papers, have a look at papers written by the people inside of those communities 
And if you're using things like museums, which I've seen a lot inside of companies, people taking photos at museums and being like, look at this amazing thing. You also have to remember who curated that museum and that it's their point of view that's gonna come across. So you are much better going to the source and asking. Collaboration and consultation, consulting with sensitivity readers, cultural advisors, community members, just to make sure that, again, what you're doing is not harming anybody. Because I don't think any of us in this room are out here to try and offend people or try and upset people. But that little bit of shame and embarrassment in asking for help, we need to let go of that. We need to be including the people in the conversation who we are making the games about or for, just to ensure. Visual representation. So depicting a large range of physical traits. Um, and again, avoiding tokenism, seeing just one character that has one trait that is totally different from all the other characters actually contributes to otherness and it isolates that character. And your players will start to react differently to that character if they are the one character that has the one trait that nobody else has. So making it sort of normalized that there is diversity in your game and not just being like, oh yeah, oh God, we should make one character different actually a negative. You should have lots of different characters. Cultural signifiers. So I'm going to come back to this because this is kind of what we were talking about with the oopsies that some games made. Um, we want to apply cultural signifiers very carefully. Accessories, symbols, hairstyles, we have to understand where those come from, what they are, and actually do the research into them rather than just pasting them on. Okay. So it's making sure that we're looking at that heritage and that background and what those things mean respectfully rather than just pasting over them. Challenging stereotypes, so subverting and challenging stereotypes and biases in character design and storytelling. So as I mentioned earlier, this leads to much more exciting results. We get to innovate, we get to create new designs, which is just so much more fun. And normalization. So some of the ways that we do this are by, by portraying diverse characters in everyday settings and not just focusing on the differences. This is because if your player is very different from your character, having those moments of relatability and humanity are what connect us all. And so even if a character is entirely different to me, I love those little moments of just real life where I'm like, oh, yeah, we do all love burgers. Amazing. It's just something to help your player connect with your character and then other things start to fall into place. We're all human, right? Intersectionality. So recognizing that individuals have overlapping identities and are not just one trait. And in fact, I'd highly, highly encourage you to step away from any characters that are just one thing, and that is their entire personality. Because not only is it not true, but it's also so boring. Like we all know that one person who makes that one hobby their entire personality. And like after seven conversations, you're like, oh my God, pick a new hobby. So our characters should be the same. They should have multifaceted personalities. They should enjoy more than one thing. They should be more than one thing. And the last one, but to me, the most important is sensitivity and empathy. So this is approaching character creation with empathy, understanding, do the research, do the work, create better characters. Creating inclusive and empathetic characters require deep understanding of the human experience, motivations, and perspectives. We do this by developing multifaceted personalities, doing the research, including those groups in the research and in our outcomes, um, designing interesting characters, but without glossing over their different facets. And what this does is it means you represent your game's community better, bam, you've made a great selling game. So I'm just trying to loop up all the things we've talked about, right? But basically you end up with a better game, better characters, hopefully increased sales, which then pushes you to make your next game with better characters, better mechanics, better sales. And creating with care, and I totally get this, takes time, research, resources, the willingness to learn, the willingness to be empathetic, but I want to point out that indies are absolutely killing it. And if indies on the tiny budgets that they have with the tiny teams that they have can do it, AAA should be hanging their head in shame because again, these are just like a selection of my favorites. You should all go play them. Um, but if we can do it with our tiny teams, tiny budgets, why can everyone not do it? And I want to end on a positive, And that is that change is happening. There are more games than ever before. 
There are more inclusive games than ever before. Every day we're having 34 new games. There is something in there for everyone. And we should be contributing to the betterment of games in everything that we do. And personally, I feel like games are such a privilege to work on. Like every day I think how lucky I am that I get to work in such a sick industry. So I just want to continue to have us improve. I want to continue to improve. I want games in general to continue to improve. And I just want us to make better games. And I know that we will. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Was there any questions? Yes, we've got one. I'm not going to be able to. That's OK. This. Can we pass Someone this microphone? It. Teamwork. Uh, to yeah. Gray Hoodie. Yeah, thank you. Hi. So I was just wondering, um, you say to avoid otherness when you're creating like a cast of characters. If you only have like five or six characters, how do you avoid um, seeming like you're only creating one character to just to fulfill a quota because if you only have a few characters and there's like you can't include everything more than once <laughs> you can't include everything more than once that is absolutely right but with five characters i think i could still think of multiple different things that those five characters could have that we could signify to our audience our differences again gender age race um we could even add in some different abilities like again everything that's adding towards your mechanics and your story still layer that in do some of them come from different backgrounds do some of them come from different areas in your world again going high fantasy because that's like my my go-to love it you know you've got maybe the wealthy elite mm -hmm. upper class versus you know the the local villager there's going to be clothing differences. There's going to be access to materials that different people have. There's loads of different signifiers we can put in that are subtle enough that our audience will recognize, you know, fancy velvet materials in a fantasy world probably means nice money versus sort of sack looking brown muddy clothes probably means not so wealthy, right? So there's like things we can do visually that hint at those differences without othering. And the, the problem when we have just one signifier on one character and it's different to the four other characters is if there is any sort of negative moment in your game, like if that character is then the bad guy or if that character has a weird moment with your character, it starts to isolate that character and it starts to reinforce negative stereotypes. We just want to, it's kind of looking at the whole design and just making sure that they have more than one thing to them does that answer your question? Yep. Thank you. Cool. Was there? Yes. Sorry. Um, that's okay. Um, how do you how do you approach uh, doing diversity in a cast of characters that's not human? So, like animals. Like if I'm creating a cast of cat characters, for example. I love this question. As a big fan of Animal Crossing, <laughs> the, the same thing. There are so many different ways. Like, how many different cat breeds are there? long hair, short hair, you know, ragdoll, Persians, like there's so many different breeds of cat that we can add in if you want different cultural signifiers, different cats come from different parts of the world. We can add in accessories and things again, carefully and considerately different body shapes. I have a very chunky cat. I love her, but she doesn't get out very much. <laughs> we can still add that diversity and that inclusion into non-human characters. And I love that you chose cats, by the way. <laughs> but even if it's not cats, you can still add in signifiers. As humans, we're programmed to recognize things and put them in boxes. It's just how our brain works. The quickest path to the answer is the one our brain will always take. So if you can use shape language, if you can use color theory, if you can use all these things in your cat designs, then awesome. You're still telling the player subtly what you want them to know about this character. Like a very feisty cat, feisty colors, right? Like we can, we can pull parts of their personality into their appearance because that's what we do with ourselves as well. I hope that answers that question. Awesome. Uh, I think you had your hand up first and then to you. Hey. Um, 
Is there a difference in terms of approaching cultural sensitivity when making a game uh, in a purely fi fictional world, whereas uh, doing doing a game that is set within our own world? There is. Um, there is a slight difference, but I wouldn't say it's huge. So one of the things I like to do when I'm coming to a, like an entirely fictional world is still do lots of research. Most of the fictional worlds that we see in games still need to have something that our player will recognize. It can be quite jarring to drop a player into a world that they've never experienced before. Like, how do they navigate? Who do they talk to? Like, you're not giving them any signposts to navigate this world. So what I like to do is find references in real life alter them but still make them relatable to the character right so we can still add in that cultural sensitivity i mean if you look at the matrix sorry random example but even though it's 90s trench coat gun wielding it still has elements of the samurai story it still has the hero's journey it's got biblical elements like we don't pull stuff out of nowhere. We always use references from the things that we've experienced, that we've absorbed, that we've learned. I mean, show me a person who can create something entirely new from nothing and I will hire them. We use the references that we've learned around us. So I don't think there's ever going to be a project that is an entirely new, never before seen anything. So we still need to layer in those things that the player is going to recognize and then Again, it's like signposting for danger. Is a really big, scary character running at you going to make you want to talk to it? Or is it going to make you want to fight it or run away? Like we're signposting to our players what they need to do in this moment as quickly as possible with visual cues. So applying cultural sensitivity to fictional universes is still necessary just to avoid those really harmful stereotypes and perpetuating sort of negative connotations, right? Hopefully that makes sense. Yes. Yeah, this is more of a question for, I suppose, your side role as a, in academia. Yes. But how do you, so, I mean, we, we struggle, obviously, we can't control the diversity of our classrooms. And sometimes you end up with an extremely set, you know, everyone's white in that particular classroom. Yeah. How do you encourage your students, if you ever end up with that sort of situation where you're talking to basically a room of everyone who looks the same, completely male, all white or something like that yeah. how do you encourage diversity when you've got such sort of a narrow group of people that you're talking to in, a, in an academic sort of setting yeah um I'm quite honest with my students um and I I kind of do have that scenario so for full transparency my class is like 90% male I have two women in my class woohoo I, first of all, wish that was slightly different only because I, I don't think we've done enough advertising on our course to show that it is a diverse and welcoming course and games is still, I think, sort of a college level, school level, seen as a STEM subject, seen as technology, seen as like very code heavy, whereas there are so many solutions to that now. There are so many different roles. Yes. Yeah, this. Coders, really? <laughs> yeah. Um, Again, like I said, I'm quite honest with my students, so I kind of hit them quite hard the first lesson they come into. And I talk about appropriation versus appreciation in our first visual studies class. But I also do teach VFX and CGI and more, I would say, like tech heavy practical stuff. And that is a very different class to teach than my visual studies class. Like the vibe is very different. I try and set them tasks, like little workshop tasks that are going to challenge them. I try and make sure that they're not repeating things. And we're, we're quite a good group of lecturers. So we're all sort of on the same page trying to push. Yeah, so we do the same sort of thing where we try to build it into the beginning. I think it's the end because we have to sort of there is a point where we have sort of have to let the students do 
their own thing. But then we end up, like I said, with a lot of very similar things at the end, you know. Yeah. Um, we have quite a competitive bunch, and so they don't like doing the same thing as everybody else, which is great because <laughs> it fosters innovation because they're looking at the person next to them being like, well, I don't want to do that. I'm going to do something completely different that no one's ever seen before, and then they make Mario. <laughs> um, so I think it's just fostering healthy competition talking about stats showing them that better selling games are diverse games have better mechanics have better art and i think with programmers it's a little bit about understanding because from where i teach i get the first years on their first day they are the first class that comes to me and i have no idea where they come from i don't know them yet i don't know what they've been exposed to i don't know what family life is like i don't know who they hang around with who their friends are what they believe what reddit searches they've been down like i don't know anything about them so i try and just make sure that i'm accessible to them as someone they can talk to and also that they see me as a human but we have like mutual respect and that if i spot any sort of red flags and designs we have a conversation about it and we you know, open that dialogue up. Because again, I'm not going to judge anybody for being exposed to maybe unsavory ideas before they came into a classroom filled with other identities. Mm -hmm. So it's just, I think it's about having those teachable moments, but not shaming anybody and keeping the dialogue open. Cool, I hope that answered. Was there any other questions? Uh, we've got one down the front. <laughs> Just down here. Get those steps in. Oh. <laughs> Hello. Thank you. Um, how would you think about uh, leaving characteristics open, so like to the interpretation of the player? Would that rather foster um, diversity or? As in, like a character creator, or? No, like more. Let's say um, you have a you have a dialogue between two people. And the gender of, of, of the protagonist is not, you know, assigned. Like you're never referred to with the gender. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm very open to games that allow you to layer in your own experience or or your own version of that story. Um, I, I mean, again, we're just trying to foster innovation, right? If you can make a character that is gender neutral and has the same sort of flaws and benefits to their personality as a normal person if, as long as you don't wipe that slate clean and make them sterile and, and not interesting mm -hmm. then great give your player options let them you know do whatever they want to do okay awesome. yeah, go on <laughs> hopefully that answered yeah thank you uh was that all questions oh we've got another one at the back i don't know what the can we <laughs> You're being recorded. <laughs> um, so specifically talking about cultural signifiers um, within character creation, do you see a way of incorporating those into a character creator in a way which is respectful so that it isn't just seen as like a cosmetic? Yeah, um, I think it's about making sure that you have in-game the space to explain things. Um, and again, I'm not UX or UI, so I maybe don't have like the perfect solution to that question. But I think um, using the cyberpunk one as, as a sort of example, by giving the player things that just look cool and not explaining the fact that that means something to a set group of people and that it's a signifier. First of all, that's not your player's fault. They didn't know. That is the developer's fault and they should have signposted somewhere or just not included it if, I mean, it really depends because if you're making a game about Māori, then yes, you should include that, but there should be some sort of context to it and you should be able to understand. And again, with Moko, to, to be more specific, they are designed differently depending on where in the Pacific you are. Um, Hawaii have a completely different culture around tattoos, but again, it's about storytelling and about tracking your progress as a person. So it is very individual. So having a design that multiple people can use, it's almost taken away the individuality of what a moko is in the first place because they are designed by the tattoo artist with the client to signpost a thing that has happened to them specifically. So that one doesn't mean anything. 
that one is just because it's cool, right? So how do you explain to your player that that thing that exists in real life does mean something and isn't just cool? That's how we end up with lots of people with them that shouldn't have them, right? Because we're normalizing the use of them. Uh, again, not UX, so I don't know specifically how I would do that, but there has to be a solution. I mean, we're very intelligent people, gamers. We uh, we can normally pick up stuff from subtle hints in games. We kind of know what we're doing. So I would trust that if I put something in a game and I QA tested it a lot, I could probably find a way to tell my player if something is super culturally significant to my story or to a group of people. And we could put it in respectfully. I mean, I would probably let them design their own, to be honest, if it were me, because that is what you actually do with that style of tattooing, is you make it yourself, it's part of your journey and your story. So that could have been a cool way to do it, give your player a pen. But again, I don't know, maybe that would have taken too long and blown more of the budget and taken another seven years, so. <laughs> But hopefully that answers. I do think there is a way to do it. I'm just, I don't have the answer right now, I guess. I would love to see a great example of it if any of you are thinking about doing that. Uh, any, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, if you pass it straight back down. Thanks. Um, I was just wondering if you could tell me about your process for iterating, iterating on character designs. Yeah, it's messy. Um, it's stressful. It involves me being super critical of myself. Whereas if I show the design to anyone else on my team, they're like, that's amazing. And I'm like, it's rubbish, throw it away. I hate it. I like to AB test. I'm a bit of a nerd for stats. So I love a little bit of AB testing. I love combining good things from all my designs. I just tend to start with really mus like messy thumbnail sketches, get shapes, get tones, get like, I'm love that art process so i go through like the whole thing and i don't mind that it takes longer than maybe just sitting down with a blank piece of paper and just drawing a character because i don't think that result is as good as going through the motions um i tend to do a lot of research i'm a very visual person so i'm a big mood board creator i do like whole pinterest boards around characters then i go to the library i get away from my computer i absorb the art of that culture if there's a specific culture or something that i need to learn about that character i absorb i absorb and then i come back and then i start again and see if what i'm making now that i have more reference and more knowledge is better and then i can combine things and then I try and take something away because what I tend to do is very maximalist. Mm -hmm. And then I look at the design and I go, oh my God, <laughs> that is a lot of information for our player to take in. Where are the things that I can simplify the shapes of this and just give them the bare details, but with flair. Mm -hmm. Is that answer? Yeah, thanks. But it's messy <laughs> yeah. the whole time. <laughs> uh, if we pass this down this way. Hi there. Um, hey. So, might be a silly question, but um, what impact do you feel your character designs have on like your world building process as a, like a studio does? Because obviously, like when you introduce a new character, that might change the dynamic of like your whole world and everything that you build around it. Yeah, it does. <laughs> is the is the short answer? Um, the world is normally for me the second thing I build, which is probably a weird way to go around that, but I like to think about narrative. That's what we do as a studio first and foremost is narrative stories. I think about narrative. I think about the way that narrative is going to be conveyed to our player. Then I think about who is the best person to convey that narrative and then what world do they live in? And I know that's different from maybe what other people do and I'm not saying my way is right, it's probably not. Some people do world first, some people do character first, some people do mechanics and aesthetic is, you know, the last thing they think about and it's to complement those aesthetics. <laughs> it complements the mechanics that they've worked on. Um, I don't think there's a right or wrong way to that. I think it's just what works for you in your studio and who you've got on your team. Because if you have somebody who's an expert in something, you use that talent. So if I had an amazing world builder, I would maybe let them take a point and, and run with some stuff and see what they come back with. But for me, I start with character because it's my big passion and my love is narrative. So I start there and move outwards. Awesome. Thank you. And I think we had, was there a question over here? Ah, uh, yes. If we pass this back down. 
Thank you. Uh, hello. I'd love to get your advice on a bit of a like practical situation. If where imagine I, I as in I, I'm working in my studio and I we have a character and the pitch for it is to be like gender neutral, um, to be sort of in between people, like almost a a totally just a human. Mm -hmm. um, th that's the pitch around the character, but the outcome of what actually comes out of it is just a like dude in a sci-fi armor. Um, um, I think it depends what your definition of gender neutral is, because are they a non-binary character? Because non-binary characters can look any way they want to. It's not conformed by this sort of like androgynous space. You can have very feminine traits, very masculine traits, and still be non-binary and still fit into that space and still take control of that. So I think it's more about what you think that character is. So I wouldn't be too hung up on like they look male because you're signposting, I'm guessing, in dialogue and in background and in all the other things that you're telling the player that they are non-binary or that they are androgynous or that they, whatever their identity is, you're giving them those cues. And actually, it's slightly cooler that you're not just going down the instant that's androgynous. You're like skewing it a little bit. Again, iterate, be really careful, make sure that you're consulting with with that group to make sure that your design isn't like uber offensive or anything that you've just missed. But yeah, I don't think you should worry too much about trying to fit them into like a middle space because people don't fit in those middle spaces. Like there's, there's a, it's a spectrum, right? Of everything. It's, it's all grays, nothing is black and white. So I think if you have other characteristics for them as well, they should be more than just that one thing. Make sure that they have a like well-rounded design, not just they have to look this way. Like what else do they do in the story? What is their role in your game? Yeah? Mm -hmm. That works. Does yeah. that help? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, a bit, of a bit of a nothing answer, but like keep going, <laughs> iterate. <laughs> uh, any other, oh, yes. Three minutes or three questions? Three minutes. three minutes. Cool. I was like, that's a lot of questions. Um, we're going to go here. Do we have, if you want to pass? Oh, thank you. Hi. Um, how do you approach uh, the compromise between, uh, in a character creator, representation and giving the player options versus scope? Uh, that's a really bad question to ask me because I spent way too long on my character creator in like every game I've worked on because I um, I myself love a character creator. It's the thing I spend way too many hours on. It's why I couldn't be a streamer because we would just do like hours of character creation and no content. Um, I think it depends. Again, it depends on your budget. It depends on who you've got on your team. It depends on how quickly you can churn out assets and options. If you have a really great 3D artist and you're doing 3D, then yep, just get them to keep going. If you've got a really great 2D artist, you know, they're gonna create options. There are really easy shortcuts. Sounds like a bit of a cheat, but there are really easy shortcuts to, for me, I did a 2D game as my first game and I designed a load of hairstyles. And then I was like, hey, I'm gonna use, a, I program in Unity, by the way. I was like, I'm just gonna change the color of this. So I'm gonna start with an asset that is white and then I'm gonna just add color to all the different options so that my, my players could literally drag and choose any color that they wanted in RGB. But like, you know, they could basically have any color. And I did that for most things that that made sense for, like t-shirts, hair, accessories, jewelry, whatever. And then I gave them fewer, but more correct options for skin tone um, and things like that. So as long as you're thinking of easier ways to get the job done but still at good quality and allowing your players that choice for me i'm always gonna opt for like do it <laughs> then don't um and there are there are, again it depends on your game if your game is very stylized then maybe it's easier than a hyper photorealistic you know that's going to take much longer but the whole game is going to take much longer so just making sure you're factoring that in and making sure that you test cannot talk about that enough, test, 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 make sure that your audience are reacting 
the same way you think they're going to react because the amount of times I've taken a character creator to a show floor with thousands of different options and people have gone, oh, I wish there was this thing. It's like, oh. <laughs> so one more asset. Okay, one more asset. We've got time. So yeah, yeah. Think about your team. Obviously, crunch is bad. Do not let them work until they die. Like keep your team safe. But if there is a quick and easy solution, add it, do it. We always want more options. Yes. And I think yours is the last question. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's not even the last question. I'm getting this. We're done. Okay, no problem. I'm so sorry. I'm around if you want to talk after. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs> Thank you.